Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Today, we're going to talk military and geopolitical analysis, or in other words, how to tell if the source you are listening to is a blithering idiot who should do us all a favor and win a Darwin Award as soon as possible. Yeah, I'm being nasty. I know, but some of what's been going on has had me furious, to put it lightly. Anyway, on with the show. My attitudes toward the situation. I'm not pro-Russia. I'm not pro-Ukraine. I'm pro-people. I'm pro-justice. And I'm pro-data. Okay? Ukraine, Russia, Canada, the United States, any country is basically an ephemeral concept. It exists for a period of time. No country lasts forever. People do. I care about justice because, hey, if you don't give people justice, they've got nothing. And I care about data because data tells you what's really going on. Feelings, beliefs, they don't serve. Data matters. <coughs> now, I'm going to toss a bunch of numbers at you. Don't get scared. This is basic budgeting 101. If you can balance your own checkbook or keep up with your credit card payments, you'll know what to, this means. Uh, now, money itself is just a proxy for resource usage. Basically, whether it's natural resources, human resources, technological resources, infrastructure, money is how you track this. You know, it's nothing else. Now, of course, military's cost to operate. We use money to figure out how much we're putting toward the militaries, obviously. And every country has its own budget, which varies depending upon the country's position, all that sort of stuff, you know, the usual yada, yada. Now, we get on to purchasing power parity. Um, this doesn't work the way most people think. They think that basically if country X has a uh, purchasing power parity of uh, 50% of country Y, that means they can buy twice as much. That's not true. Purchasing power parity basically applies to local labor only. If you are buying your fuel on the international market, you go out and say, I want the purchasing power parity price to one of the oil producers, they're going to tell you to get stuffed. If you go to a manufacturer of high technology products, like say microchips or, well, something else you just can't get because you don't have the ability to build it in your country directly, at least not easily, you're going to pay the market price. It's just the way it works. You, know, you can count on your internal labor. You can count on... If you're building equipment in country, the labor into that going into that equipment, but the steel, the steel is going to be priced at international market prices. So, purchasing power parity isn't as big an impact, or doesn't have as big an impact as most people think. Now, knowing military spending in context, and I said in context is the key to understanding military power. If country Y is spending. 500 million and country uh, X is spending 200 million, country Y is going to have an advantage in a conventional war. Now, notice that conventional. You're talking guerrilla warfare? That's a whole different ballpark. We're just talking straight conventional warfare here. In a conventional warfare, the country that spends more will generally have more equipment and newer equipment. It's just the way it works. It's like yourselves. I mean, like, let's face it, if you've got more money to spend, you're going to have a newer car. You can afford it. If you don't have the money to spend, you'll be driving some old junker. It's just the way it works. Now, there are a variety of bad actors out there giving absolutely horrid military analysis. And when I say horrid, well, I've spent a lot of time on their uh, channels screaming at them and calling them fools and other things. Reasons? Hey, 
It doesn't matter whether they are stupid, uninformed, or someone else's assets. They are doing damage, a lot of damage, because they're giving out really bad information, which is misleading people. And, uh, you know, here's a couple examples. Weeb Union. The guy is so pro-Russian, it is sick. Then you've got History Legends, who has never seen a Ukrainian defeat that he didn't celebrate. Uh, but he seems totally unable to admit that Russia can ever lose. Oh, and I have called him a bloody fool and an effing idiot and a whole bunch of other things to his face on live streams before. He knows what I think. Um, Military and Foreign Affairs Network. Now, him, he's an interesting case. I think that he is someone who has got his head so far into the media space that that's all he's paying attention to. And pardon me, but the media, whether it's right-wing, left-wing, or mainstream, is bloody useless at reporting anything other than sports scores. They get the sports scores right. They'll generally get it right who, which, celebrities, which celebrity is dating which celebrity. They do not understand geopolitics. They do not understand war. It's very rare that you'll get a reporter at one of these places who's actually served. And even if you get a reporter who's served, quite often the editor butchers the story. So you end up with nothing better. But I think that he's got his head so far into the media that he's not paying attention to the real world. Now we run into a couple of interesting uh, characters because this information I'm going to present to you is the sort of stuff that is taught in command school. If you get anything above lieutenant, you know this because they teach it. So the fact that they either don't appear to know it or are totally ignoring it is really telling. Um, I have to admit that these two characters, I personally think, are probably Russian assets, whether paid or not. I mean, they might be being uh, blackmailed for all I know. But anyway, Colonel Douglas McGregor, so-called Colonel. Yeah, he was one. He's no longer active service, so I don't consider him a Colonel. Um, he has been basically stating that Ukraine is going to fall apart every single day since uh, March 2022. Ukraine hasn't fallen apart yet. He keeps stating that, oh, nobody can supply them. The Russian military is too strong. It seems Ukraine's getting lots of supplies, and the Russian military doesn't appear all that strong. Yeah, they're crawling forward, but at a pace that would make a snail uh, wince. Then you've got Scott Ritter, supposedly a captain. Um, at least his Wikipedia page he said he was. I've never seen his service record myself. Again, I've never seen McGregor's service record, never bothered to look. But the guy is so horribly pro-Russian and totally ignoring the numbers that it just doesn't make sense. I mean, as I said, this is stuff that's taught in command school. You get to the rank of captain or above, you damn well know it. Now, then there are some informed commenters out there. Uh, some of these people will probably not like, but there's habitual line crosser who I find horribly funny. His green screen videos are hilarious. And I know a lot of people are going to consider them overly sarcastic and nasty. They aren't. He knows the numbers. Now, he's enlisted, current serving. He knows the numbers. Why won't the, the officers know the numbers? Then you've got Laser Pig. Laser Pig has never served. He's a historian. Historians do research. He knows the numbers. How about Malcolm Nance? Malcolm Nance on, uh, well, I think it was just before the invasion started, did a video where he basically said, this is going to be a disaster for Russia. And, well, how many dead has Russia lost? How many tanks? How many fighter planes? How many ships? Yeah. 
I think Malcolm was dead on right on that. Then there's military and history. Uh, military and history does a superb job. Again, historian, he understands things, and he knows the numbers. You've got Perun. Perun has never served, as far as I know. Has basically, all we know about him is his YouTube name. But the guy knows numbers. He knows research. His research is superb. I highly recommend him. Ryan McBeth. Now, Ryan McBeth is another former enlisted who apparently knows the numbers. Uh, this isn't surprising, considering he's also got a bit of an intelligence background. But the guy knows what he's talking about. Um, Chris at Task and Purpose. Chris didn't know the numbers when he was serving, but when he started Task and Purpose, he started looking into this stuff, and he knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's trustworthy. The people that are listed here generally get things right. I said, note that I said generally. Everybody makes mistakes, but unlike the people on the previous page, they're right a hell of a lot of the time. The people on the previous page are wrong almost all the time. Now, I knew this beforehand. Uh, this is the message that I posted on February the 24th of 2022. You can go and see it on my X account. It's sitting there pinned. <coughs> the night before, I'd confidently told my ex-wife that there was no way that Putin would invade Ukraine because I knew the numbers. I woke up in the morning to catch merry hell because Putin had invaded, invaded Ukraine. And I posted this. As I said, it was a bit of a long thread. But, uh, you know, it depends on the actions of various governments. I was pretty sure I knew what the actions of the governments were going to be at the time, for a variety of reasons. But, anyway. Oops. This stupid thing. Okay, there we are. Next page. Russia has a lot of resources, but also a demographic problem. The population is due, dropping due to a lack of immigration. Russia is not a sought-after destination. Um, they also have this um, issue that their birth rate is really far below replacement. Uh, Russia also has huge technology issues due to a lack of funds to upgrade infrastructure. When I say upgrade infrastructure, we're talking shipyards, plants, that sort of thing. Um, the lack of infrastructure upgrades in a variety of critical industries means that certain sanctions would cause the Russian economy to begin a slow-motion crash, probably taking four to five years. I think. I don't have solid numbers for the time. It's just a guess. Now, note that I said slow-motion, four to five years. Everybody who's been screaming about sanctions was saying, Oh, they should knock Russia out immediately. Well, February the 24th, 2022, I said four to five years. Okay, now, I do, however, have sold numbers on critical manufacturing plants and companies in Russia that could be expanded if they could buy the technology. Specific sanctions on the technologies for those critical plants would cause a slide that would make Soviet times look exciting, enticing. Now, they also, of course, cause smugglers, but that's something that you keep on working with with sanctions. You expand them to cover the smugglers. Russia can't win. I have no idea why Putin is doing this. He could be working off bad intelligence, be suffering from early stage dementia, or maybe just sort of touch that he has no idea the reaction he's setting off. I almost feel sorry for the poor bastard. He is toast. That was my opinion then. It's still my opinion. Now, I've got a spreadsheet here, which you're going to love. The original spreadsheet and data was provided by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. They are a highly rated agency. They do a lot of research on military spending worldwide, and their data is about the solidest you are going to get, unless you actually have access to the individual country's numbers. Um, yes, I know it's possible to hide certain military expenditures by running them through different departments. That's always going to be an issue, but it's difficult to hide big things. Now, I reformatted the spreadsheet to make it a lot easier to read. Um, you really didn't need to see all the numbers back to 1949, for example. 
and you didn't need to see all the countries because, well, okay, how should I put it? Vatican City is never going to be a military superpower. I don't care how hard they try. They just don't have the capabilities. Um, none of the data has been changed. I said, I did reformat to make it easier to read. I made it, you know, stuff bigger and all that sort of stuff. Um, a copy of the presentation, the edited spreadsheet, and a link to the orig Cipri original on their website are available for free download on my Patreon. Link in the video description. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and all the usual YouTube jump. I think this one is one you might want to share a bit more because people are going to be interested in these numbers. They are very um, brutal in a lot of ways. Anyway, now, on to the numbers. This is the CIPRI database. Um, I wish that stupid thing would go away. It's blocking things. Military expenditure by country and constant $2022 US. Um, it says 48 in 2023, but as I said, I cut off the bottom part and I also cut off 2023 because 2022 was the last year before the Ukraine war kicked off big time and at that point military spending by everybody kind of went up so you know I'm just interested in what happened before the start of the war now I added up things you know you've got the totals here for each year but then I did from 2011 and then from 2001. Why did I do that? <clears throat> because weapon systems have an age limit. Like um, milk, they spoil. When I say spoil, if you have a 10-year-old weapon system, the odds are it's not going to have the latest software. It's not going to have the most recent sensor upgrades. Technology moves that fast. And if you have a 20-year-old system, it's going to be even further back. So anything built within the last 10 years is definitely frontline capable. Anything built in the 10 years before that is, well, kind of iffy on the front line, in my personal opinion. Now, I know Ukraine's been using a lot of it on the front line and having a lot of success, but... There's reasons for that, which we will get into. Anyways, you'll notice that only one country has its name out, the United States. There's a reason for that. Everybody knows that the United States is the big military spender. I couldn't hide them, so here they are. They spent $860 uh, billion. Yeah. And you can see the numbers. I mean, they are absolutely astronomical. As a matter of fact... The United States quite often spends more than every other country on the planet. And that's not joking. I mean, they really do. Now, the problem is that you can't call, consider the United States in, in isolation. I was going to do this in order of country, but you can't consider the United States in isolation for a simple reason. Cipri rates things by regions, uh, not continents. It rates North America as one continent. And, uh, just a second, just have to get this thing to scroll over a bit. We need to look at the other North American power. And the reason we need to do that is it's Canada. Now, just a second, while well, I Change the color here. Damn it. <laughs> Sometimes. Sorry. Change the font to black. The reason we need to consider Canada is a simple, it's very simple. Most people don't realize how closely the Canadian and United States militaries are integrated. And when I say closely, if an airplane, an unidentified airplane, approaches North American airspace, it could be met by a U.S., a Canadian, or both airplanes. 
because we have an integrated command structure on the Air Force and it is very integrated. This means that if we're operating with the United States overseas, our planes have no problems integrating with them. Okay? Factor two, our Navy is set up to slot into U.S. carrier groups. Yeah, it is. That's why the ships we have are built the way they are. They are anti-submarine, anti-air warfare frigates combined. And basically, the 12 of them give the United States an extra 12 escorts if needed. And the thing is that, well, both Canada and the United States have a problem. If they want to fight, they have to get to where the fight is. Of course, it's also protection. We aren't going to be invaded easily. Um, finally, the armies train together. And when I say they train together, we share training grounds, literally. There's a huge tank training ground out in um, Alberta that is shared with the United States and Canada. We train on their training grounds. And basically... This makes the United, the uh, North American region the most seriously OP on the planet. Because, I mean, look, Canada's 14th. But, still a lot of money, isn't it? It's a lot of money. Now, um, let's go back to the start because we need to go to the second biggest military spender on the planet. And that is our friends in China. Oh, and everybody said Russia was the second strongest military, but look at this. The Chinese are spending nearly three times as much per year. Nearly three times as much. So why would anyone think that Russia had the second strongest military? Okay, there is one thing I just skipped on the United States, and I should mention for China and Russia, because it's a negative against them. They have nukes. And you're probably saying, but hold on, nukes make you a superpower. Well, no, nukes don't make you a superpower. Not in a conventional war. In a conventional war, nukes are useless. They're a drain on resources. They cost you to maintain. Have you looked at the cost for the United States to replace the Minuteman missile systems? It is astronomical. And that's just to keep their strategic nuclear deterrent going. They're also having to redo uh, the warheads. China's building a bunch of new warheads. They're building missiles. All of that costs. They're also building a lot of brand new fighter jets. They've got the second largest fifth generation fighter jet fleet in the world. And, well, at one point they were basically using upgraded old Soviet tech. Uh, they have moved ahead and they're producing some very competent looking equipment now. I don't know how it would actually function in a war because, well, we haven't seen it yet. Okay, let's go to... Eastern Europe, where we see country number three. Now, country number three is, yeah, it's Russia, finally. Now, look at how little they're spending compared to China. Look at how little they're spending compared to the United States. How in hell would Russia be able to stand up to the United States in the conventional conflict? Yes, they have a lot of tanks. A lot of those tanks were built 30, 40, 50 years ago and have not been upgraded. They just are not survivable on a modern battlefield. Oh yeah, you can use them for artillery. You know, it's the same with the APCs. They've been pulling out stuff that, well, yeah, okay, it's got a gun on it. I guess it's got some armor, but you can shoot through it with a large machine gun. That is not good equipment. Now, at this point, we're going to mention initial factor. You may have noticed that I had the corruption perception index down there. And there's a reason for that. The corruption perception index is 
not solid because it is perception, but it's a useful indication of how people within the country view the country itself. So United States is at 69, which I mark basically anything above 70 is green as far as I'm concerned. Anything below 69 is yellow and below 50 is red. <clears throat> you notice that China is at 45, so we're in the red. Russia is at 28. That is so low that it is astounding. Um, Peter Zihan has claimed many times on videos that he thinks that Russia is losing as much as a third of the military budget to mega yachts and villas and uh, cons. You know, the usual stuff that corrupt people buy. I have a suspicion it's probably closer to a half. Um, I'm Canadian, and Canada is an immigration destination for everybody. We have Russians here, we have Ukrainians, we have Poles, we have Kazakhs, and I know a lot of these people. A lot of them are ex-military. When I say ex-military, they're people who served before 91, before the Soviet Union came down. So yeah, a lot of these folks are my age or, you know, but they saw what things were like. And the amount of corruption that I've been told about would utterly shock you. And this is corruption that isn't at the top levels, it's at the bottom levels. You know, people pulling electronics out of stuff to sell it. Uh, you being able to buy into a mil walk into a military base and buy some grenades so you can go grenade fishing. There's just too many of these stories, and they span too, too much time. My earliest contact was a Russian who served on the front, and then when they found he was a mechanic, they switched him to a tank uh, repair facility, which meant that he survived. Um, and uh, who moved to Canada. I met him back in the, uh, I guess it was 1978 when I met Nikolai. And Nikolai had a very jaundiced view of things. When I say jaundiced, a lot of people have jaundiced views of their country, but his was extreme. And this was actually quite common among uh, people who I talked to, I, you know, Estonians, Latvians, Everybody from that area, from the area around Russia, basically has a, had a negative impact, a negative view of the impact that communism had in the area. Okay, let's move on to the Middle East, where we have player number four, who is, guess who? Oh, well, yeah. They're rich as hell. No wonder they can afford to toss some money at their military. Yep, Saudi Arabia, oil com oil country. They can afford to spend on their military a lot more than many countries can, and they do. And they buy fairly good equipment. They don't buy, um, how should I put it? They don't buy rifles with stocks made by Battelle. And if anybody's really interested, I can provide you a link to the song that I got that from. It's pretty hilarious. Let's go to country number five. Country number five is India. Now, why would India be spending so much on defense? Hmm, might be the neighborhood. Uh, unfortunately, India, like China, falls into the corrupt category, and we have no idea how much actually gets to the military. We do know that they buy modern gear. They're buying Rafale fighters from France. Uh, they're buying MBDA missiles. A lot of really nice kit. But how much money doesn't get there, well, who knows. Then we go to Western Europe. And in Western Europe, we have, I wonder who. Oh, well, it's the UK. Well, yeah, the UK actually keeps a reasonably large fleet. They're one of the few countries in the world that run aircraft carriers, others being the United States, China, Russia, kind of, 
Theirs has been in dry dock for the last five years. Uh, as I said, India, the UK, France, um, Brazil has an aircraft carrier. Australia's got a couple. Japan has some. But it's not common these days. Anyway, the UK has a big military. Uh, it's most heavy, heavily navally, naval for, focused. There's a reason for that. The United Kingdom is an island. They can't get to, they have to get to the fight before they can fight. Next in Western Europe, we have France. Another country that keeps a large navy, still has a number of over, overseas territories that they're administering or, well, still hold by rate of conquest, depends on your definitions. And um, so they do spend a fair bit of money. They're also like the United States, China, Russia, India, and the UK in nuclear power, which counts against them because they have to spend on their nuclear deterrent, which is no use in a conventional conflict. Now, you note that both the UK and France are in the green, which means that probably almost all the money that's being allocated to the military is actually getting there. Yeah, there's waste. There's going to be wastage, but it's not going to be like <laughs> uh, somebody buying a super yacht. Now, let's go on to the next one in Western Europe, which is Germany. Oh, and everybody thinks Germany's weak militarily. Uh, well, Germany is weak militarily. They have some bad issues with procurement. Uh, they have manning issues. But the thing is, this is all fixable stuff. Uh, you actually run into similar issues. You know, the UK's had manning issues. The United States has had manning issues. Canada has had manning issues. It's all fixable. It just requires political will. Now, will they fix it? It sounds like it. They're sure talking a good game. Now, let's go to East Asia where we have the next one. And that is... Japan. Oh, gee. I wonder why Japan is spending so much money. Oh, right. China's spending a hell of a lot of money and they're right next door. Yeah, um, Japan is spending a fair bit of money and they have a fairly competent looking military with modern equipment. Uh, they build their own ships, they build a lot of their own equipment. The economy hasn't been the greatest over the last few years, but it's a country where corruption is relatively low and the, um, how should I put it? Not Imperial Japanese Navy. <laughs> yeah, right. They name the ship Kaga, and it's an aircraft carrier. Um, is um, actually growing quite uh, quickly, and it is a very tough force. It's not anything that anybody in the right mind would want to tangle with in a conventional war. Again, I'm always talking conventional war. Now, Germany and Japan have an advantage here. Uh, unlike France and the UK, they aren't paying to maintain a nuclear deterrent. This makes a big difference. Now we'll go to East Asia, where we have... South Korea. <coughs> Again, you wonder why they spend money. Uh, gee, would it have something to do with this Kim Dynasty just to the north? Uh, yeah. South Korea also has aircraft carriers. <coughs> technically. When I say technically, they're helicopter carriers, but they can handle F-35Bs, and there's always a possibility that South Korea could turn around and decide to spend the money. Now, South Korea does have a few corruption problems, but compared to a lot of the countries on this list, they're in pretty good shape. Now we go to Eastern Europe. And 
Who do we have? Oh, gee. Look at that. Their corruption perception index for Ukraine is higher than the one for Russia, which means Ukraine is probably less corrupt. And everybody's screaming about Ukrainian corruption. Yeah, right. Okay, Ukraine is not rocking a nuclear arsenal. Therefore, they haven't had that expense to take care of. They have had, however, an ongoing war since 2014, which has been draining them of resources. Now, you notice that the spending before 2022 was actually relatively small, but in 2022, well, okay, 2022 was the year of the invasion. They were the quickest country to ramp up on military spending for obvious reasons, and you'll notice how much it jumped. Now, um, there are a couple things to mention here. First off, the Ukrainian numbers are really, really inaccurate. And the reason I know they're inaccurate is because, well, Ukraine has corruption problems. Since 2014, a variety of countries have been uh, training Ukrainian troops outside of, well, sometimes inside Ukraine, but sometimes outside Ukraine. The point being that this training isn't getting robbed by corruption. It's being paid for by the sponsoring countries. Uh, the first four countries were Norway, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, I believe. I believe others have been added, been added after that. But the point is that this number of uh, $4.5 billion is inaccurate because it doesn't reflect the training that comes, came from outside. Also during this period of time, Ukraine started to receive support in the way of medical supplies and quite often helmets and ballistic vests, which saved lives. And saving lives actually is a major benefit to your military bottom line. If you can keep someone alive and they can go back to combat whether it's you know three months later or whatever or even go replace somebody in um, your um, logistics corps sitting at a desk so that they can go fight that's an advantage for you so you know all of this protective stuff made a huge difference the training itself made a huge difference a lot of the training that the people in Ukraine were getting was probably crap. Again, look at the corruption rating, look at the corruption rating for Russia. Anybody who's in the red has probably got training issues. I'll say that straight off. They probably have training issues, bad training issues. How bad? Well, we won't know. Um, Ukraine... obviously had been working on their corruption for a while and because of the fact that they were fighting the military was one of the places where it was being targeted so you know we can't really tell how much was wasted as compared to how much was wasted in uh, Russia for example um, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was nearly 50% in Ukraine as well uh, early on but later on it was probably reduced considerably but I have no idea how much Okay, let's move to Western Europe. We are our first yellow in Western Europe. Who is it? Oh, gee, it's Italy. Italy, I think you need to work on your corruption. Um, you notice that Italy is spending a fair bit on defense. Um, they are also a country that runs an aircraft carrier. Again, it's helicopter, but it is an aircraft carrier, and it could handle F-35Bs if Italy were to put them on it. Last I checked, they hadn't, but uh, it's quite possible they could. And, you know, again, you're talking a reasonable amount of money. If you look at the um, total, um, basically, they spent far more over the 10-year and 20-year periods than Ukraine did. Ukraine was trying not to spend money after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union and basically it hurt them defensively. Now we'll go on to Oshina and you can probably guess who this is.
Yep, it's the boys down under. Australia. Australia has two aircraft carriers. Uh, technically, they're being used as helicopter carriers right now, but they could handle F-35Bs if warranted. And um, now I'm going to mention something I probably should have mentioned before that is probably going to be disturbing. And that is that there are certain countries on this list who could go nuclear in literally a split second um, if they wanted. Uh, Canada, for instance, has its own nuclear industry, designs its own reactors, and has a very, very big reactor fleet. Japan has its own reactor fleet. Uh, as far as I know, they don't do any reactor design there, but yeah, they've got the engineering chops to manage it. South Korea has a big uh, reactor fleet, and again, they've got the engineering chops to manage it. Um, Ukraine probably could. They've got the reactor fleet. They probably have the engineering capabilities, and like Canada and Japan and Italy, Ukraine has experience in building long-range missiles. And yeah, Canada builds long-range missiles. You didn't know that, did you? We build a lot of weird stuff. Now, let's go over to the Middle East where we have the next country. And that is Israel. Now, you'll notice that Israel has a corruption problem. Definitely. They're below 70, but they are well above 50. Uh, the odds are that most of Israel's military budget is going there. Their negative is that they do not have, that they, they do have a nuclear arsenal. Another negative for Israel is they are so small. Um, this makes Israel difficult to defend. Um, Russia's difficult to defend because it's so big. <laughs> yeah, you can't win. Um, so you can see why they spend a lot of money. Uh, the Middle East, as we all know, has been a flashpoint for years. And yeah, that's as far as I'm going to go with that. So let's squeeze over here a little bit further. And we'll go to South America. Here's our first South American customer. Anybody want to guess who it is? Now you probably know. I mean, it's pretty obvious. There's only one country in South America with an aircraft carrier, Brazil. Unfortunately, Brazil has massive corruption problems. How massive? Well, let's see. The president, current president spent time in jail. Um, the uh, past president is, well, <sighs> best left unmentioned. Yeah, they spend a fair bit of money, but... I have no idea how much actually gets to the military. Now, one thing I do know is that they buy good kit when they do buy it. They're buying Sab Gripen fighters. They're paying Sweden for training. So they are getting good stuff, but does it all get there? Who knows? Again, probably not with that sort of a corruption rating. Now we go back to Western Europe. We go and our second yellow in Western Europe who is Spain. Oh, Spain. You really got to work on things. Anyway, um, Spain, again, spends a fair amount on defense. Um, now, they don't spend as much as some of the others, but again, Spain does not have a nuclear deterrent fund, so they don't have that drag on their uh, spending. Um, I would rate them way higher than Brazil just because the corruption index level makes me think that more of the money is actually getting to where it's supposed to go, but that's me. Central Europe. Who is in Central Europe? Oh, it's Poland. I wonder why Poland would spend so much money. Might it be the fact that one of their neighbors is an irredentist, aggressive state that has been raging a war in Ukraine since 2014 and has invaded a bunch of other countries, which I haven't mentioned, 
and I should have mentioned, sorry, Georgia, I didn't mention you. What Russia did to you was horrid. Anyway, Poland spends a fair bit on their military. Um, habitual line crosser, apparently they've really ramped up military spending since 2022, by the way, but habitual line crosser has called them a uh, European Texas. And I think that comes as a good description. Uh, Poland's military spending uh, ethos at the current time seems to be, oh, really? You've got that? How many can we buy? Yeah. Now we go to East Asia, where we're talking about another yellow country, Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is almost out of the yellow. Taiwan's corruption problem, to a large extent, comes from West Taiwan. <laughs> Sorry, had to get that dig in there. Yes, the CCP is Taiwan's corruption problem. Basically, the CCP wants to take Taiwan. They've said that any number of times. They're trying to bribe people. But a fair chunk of the Taiwanese budget is actually getting to their military, and Taiwan has an advantage here. They're not rocking a nuclear deterrent, though, again, they're a country that could go nuke if they wanted relatively quickly. They have the capabilities. And yes, I looked into it. Um, if you guys want, I'll cut a video on why certain countries could go nuke if they wanted to fairly quickly. And... Um, they also have a lot of um, long-range weapons, meaning that if China was to, you know, pull an invasion, the invasion fleet would be targeted with harpoons and all sorts of indigenous missiles. The airplanes would be targeted. Uh, China supposedly got 1,300 antique fighters that they're going to use as drones. Uh, those should be easy to kill with almost any weapon system. Taiwan will be in a reasonably good place. The other thing is that Taiwan has a lot of old war buddies. And you're going to be, hold on, what the hell are you talking about? Look, Taiwan, the Republic of China, to give it its proper name, is a longtime friend and ally of a whole bunch of countries. They fought with us to defeat Japan in World War II. They've always been a friend. They've never screwed us over. You see the point? Why have half a dozen countries been running warships through the Taiwan Strait in a bloody conga line? Because the People's Republic of China isn't listening to diplomatic messages, so we decided to get a little bit more obvious. Unfortunately, obvious doesn't seem to work with them, and I have a suspicion it's going to get kinetic at some point, but... Well, actually, this is where I was worried about things getting kinetic, not Ukraine. So I didn't think Putin was going to be stupid enough. Okay, let's go to the Middle East where we have our next big spender. Now, Turkey, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and I'm sorry about that, folks, from Turkey. Um, I haven't got used to the new pronunciation yet. The country is a military powerhouse, even though corruption is fairly high there. They have aircraft carriers, at least two, if I remember correctly a uh, reasonably large fleet of ships. Their air fleet isn't the most modern, but they're working on that. They have an amazing range of drone technology, which uh, we've seen at use in Ukraine. And yes, the Bayraktar TV2 is still being used in Ukraine. No, you're not seeing images of killing stuff because it's being used for reconnaissance, which, is, which was its main role the entire time. The killing stuff was an advantage. Anyway, anybody fighting with them is in a heap of trouble in a conventional war. 
Now we go to Western Europe, where we run into a real high achiever here, 80% on the Corruption Perception Index. Wow. Wonder who that is. Oh, look, it's the Netherlands. Got to love the Dutch. Um, hi, Kaylee. <laughs> Sorry. Kaylee lives in the Netherlands. I follow her YouTube channel. Uh, they have a very solid military. Again, almost all of the money is actually getting to where it needs to be. They've been upgrading. Uh, they're buying F-35s, which is how they retired the F-16s to give them to Ukraine. Their Navy is undergoing a major modernization. And you really need to look up the story of the uh, Dutch submarine arm in World War II. Never mind the terrible twins. The Dutch in World War II were ferocious. And I mean absolutely ferocious. Um, let's go to Southeast Asia where we have another green. I wonder who that is. Oh, it's Singapore where my buddy Wyatt lives. Um, by the way, folks, Defense Politics Asia runs a live stream every weekend. And they also run regular map updates, or Wyatt does. He does a pretty good job on it. He's even-handed. Um, I didn't put him on the recommend list because I appear on his live streams on a semi-regular basis, and that felt a little bit too incestuous. Singapore has an advantage. They're spending a hell of a lot of money. They have a disadvantage. You can walk everywhere. Yeah, the place is pretty small. Um, we were quite surprised to find out that Wyatt in his 30s didn't have a driver's license because, as he put it, he's never needed it before. He had to get it because of his military service. <coughs> yeah, that's another thing. Singapore has a lot of active and reserve service personnel. Singapore is one of the few countries that does... Um, Sorry, my mind's gone blank. Not mobilization that does enlistments of involuntary soldiers. In other words, draftees. That's it. Singapore does the draft right. It's one of the few countries that does, from what I can tell. Uh, the soldiers there who are draftees get paid well or reasonably well um, they aren't mistreated it's you know a lot different than it is in a lot of countries where the um, corruption score is really bad okay let's go to North Africa where we have Algeria well okay you can kind of understand that Algeria had a civil war there's a civil war going on in the south of it there's wars going on in Libya. Algeria lives in a dangerous neighborhood. You can understand why they want to spend on defense. Um, if something happens, they're going to be ready. Now, yeah, they got a lot of problems with corruption, but they're spending more than anybody else in their area, so they're probably in pretty good shape. We go to South Asia where we have another really corrupt country, and that is Pakistan. Oh, wow. Poor Pakistan. Yeah. You know, with all the stuff Pakistan's been through in the last few years, the flooding and all that, and you've got this level of corruption perception on the corruption perception index, you know that the people who got hurt did not get the help they needed. Um, Pakistan has a huge negative. They don't spend a hell of a lot, and they do have a nuclear arsenal. That nuclear arsenal is a huge drag on their um, costs, but they do tend to buy new equipment on a semi-regular basis at least. And some of the equipment they're buying is what I would consider regular, relatively competent. So you can't really count them out, but they're not a major contender in a stand-up drag-out fight. Drag-down. Stand-up drag-down fight. Whatever. 
I can't even speak today. Okay, let's go to South America. We have another red country. Colombia. Colombia has been dealing with a an insurgency for years, and the military has been used to handle it. Uh, whether or not the military handled it properly is something that, well, there's a lot of opinions on. My personal opinion is that it was a disaster. However, Colombia does get training from outside countries, which means that their military spending isn't really reflective. It should actually be higher from one point of view, even though it's lower from the corruption point of view. Let's go back to Southeast Asia, where we have another very corrupt country, and that is Indonesia. Now, Indonesia actually does have a reasonably strong military, but, and here's the but, it's strong in terms of what they're buying. I don't know that the people are getting the training. You know, if the corruption protection index is this high, you probably have problems in your country with money getting stolen. Okay, let's go to Central America. And I think this is the first Central American country on the list. And it is Mexico. Now, Mexico is an interesting case. Mexico is militarily an extremely weak country. And here we see, but look at the money they spend. Even with the corruption perception index, they must have a lot of stuff. Yes, they do, but Mexico, like Switzerland, is unable to project that power. They can't go anywhere. So, if there's a problem somewhere else, they have to hitch a ride. Yeah, literally. Um, let's go back to Western Europe. We have the final three, and I'll turn them all black at the same time because you can see they're all really high in the greens. So who are they? And they are Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Now, um, curiously, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark all have really strong weapons production industries, too. Oh, yeah. You want to buy fighter jets? Um, no, this is where I'm going to get an argument from people. They're going to say that the Saab Gripen isn't fifth generation. I'm going to say it probably is closer to a fifth generation than anything else out there, if it isn't a fifth generation. It does have some reduced observability and has capabilities that no fourth generation fighter or 4.5 generation fighter has straight up um, if I was to put a Gripen up against an SU-57 or the uh, Chinese uh, J-20 I'd bet on the Gripen literally um, I think they're that good uh, Norway they've got the Kongsberg defense missiles Denmark I forget what all they've got but they've got a ton of stuff too and it Basically, you're talking really solid equipment. These countries produce stuff that works. So let's go back over here. You'll notice this, there's the 30 countries. The two countries in North America said North America is kind of ridiculously OP. Look at the total military spending for North America. It's just insane. Okay. Now, let's look at East Asia, which is China, Taiwan, um, Japan, India, or sorry, India, South Asia. But you know, look, look at here. We're talking a large amount of money. Most of that money in East Asia is coming from China. Like, out of the $400 billion here, 291 billions from China. Okay, let's go to Western Europe. Nine countries. Now, all the Western Europe country, European countries who are on this list are members of NATO. They total spend in total that much per year, which is, as you can see, far more than Russia spends per year. All these countries have less corruption than Russia. 
Why would anybody think that Russia could beat Western Europe? You'd have to be a bloody idiot to think that. Okay, let's go to the Middle East. The Middle East is the next big spending reason. Notice that I put it in order by the 2022 number, you know, the uh, 20 year numbers. Uh, why is it higher in the uh, 2022 numbers? You know, because uh, over the last few years, uh, how should I put it? Military spending in 2022 is actually ramping down there. <laughs> Seriously, compared to what it was before. Until Hamas. Yeah, now it's ramping back up again. Um, Eastern Europe, we've got two countries, Ukraine and Poland. And well, you know why they're spending. You can see how much they're spending. Or sorry, Eastern Europe is Ukraine and Russia. You can see how much they're spending. Jeez, I gotta get my... <clears throat> I've been doing this for so long that I'm starting to lose my train. So Eastern Europe, most of that spending is Russia, as you can see, but Ukraine is spending about half as much as Russia is. So even with corruption at the same level, it's obvious that Russia isn't just gonna walk over Ukraine. They would have to use nearly their entire military if you take the three to one standard as being accurate when you're fighting a, against an opponent who's defending. In other words, if you're on the, the invader is typically the rule of thumb is three to one. Now, that rule of thumb is not accurate. It's very generic. I know of cases where the attacker inflicted seven to one, but that was an odd case. And no, it wasn't two, un two untrained militaries. It was Canada versus the United States in 1942. Friendly fire incident. A very messy one. Um, then we go to South Asia. Again, you've got a lot of spending there. South Asia, India, Pakistan, neighboring countries. They don't get along. They fought a couple wars. Um, India doesn't like China all that much, even though they're in BRICS. So they're kind of uh, fighting with China on the northern frontier on a semi-regular basis. Um, Pakistan has to be worried about Afghanistan falling apart or maybe deciding to go berserko. It's a really weird area to be in geopolitically. And you can see why they spend a lot of money. Now, South America is very insulated as far as military, you know, from military conflicts. South America has enormous oceans separating it from anybody that is really likely to fight it, except for the countries in South America. And really, they tend to get along fairly well, or at least did until Maduro took over Venezuela. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing an uptick in spending in uh, Brazil right now, for example, and why they're uh, so interested in their um, gripping fighters. Now we go to Oceania. Um, Australia has a big problem. It's called the People's Republic of China. As far as the rest of the people in Oceania, Australia can handle them quite easily and Australia has the um, expeditionary capability that a lot of countries lack. As I said, Switzerland can't invade anyone. Israel can't invade anyone, really. They don't have the logistics capability to get anybody anywhere. Um, Turkey, I, they could invade somebody as long as it was in the Mediterranean, but that's about as far as they're going to get. They just don't have the logistics. The United States, China, they have logistics. Russia did. Um, I don't think they do anymore. Um, the UK, France, they've got the logistics to be able to handle something like that. Um, it's you know not something that most countries do because, well, hey, most countries don't fight overseas. 
Um, now we go to Southeast Asia. We've got the two countries there, um, which are, sorry, I forgot who they were again. Southeast Asia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Well, Singapore is near China. Singapore isn't unfriendly with China, but Singapore is also near Burma. Singapore is near Malaysia. There's a lot of stuff going on in the area where Singapore is, so you can understand why they spend money. Um, Indonesia is forced to spend money. They're an island nation, and the only way to tie the islands together is by a navy. They have to spend money. They have no choice. Then we go to Central Europe, which was Poland. As you can see, they're spending a fair bit, and you know why. North Africa, we go to Algeria. And our final one in Central America being Mexico. Now, again, look at this. Down at the bottom, we've got NATO. NATO spent $1.1 trillion in 2022. Russia spent $1 hundred billion dollars a tenth of that less than a tenth how the hell is russia supposed to invade anybody and get anywhere they're going to get crushed how is china going to invade anybody if you include just the uh, countries that have um interests in the pacific which basically comes down to the united states um, Taiwan, of course, South Korea, Indonesia, Australia, Canada, France, the UK, Japan. Um, almost all of these are friendly to the United States, not China. Again, how does China win in a conventional war? They can't. Oh, they can do a lot of damage, and, you know, people are going to point out this, or have been probably screaming at this point in the comments section about the RAND uh, Corporation uh, studies showing that the United States would lose a couple aircraft carriers, and there's all that, and the Canadian military reports that it's not ready, and the German military's got problems, and all of this is perfectly true. But, and I'll say this is a but because I'm going to recommend doing something I just did not do. Go on the mainstream media and search for Russian corruption arrests or Chinese corruption arrests and see what pops up. The list will blow your mind. And some of the amounts these people are accused of stealing, you know, you break into someone's, the police break into their mansion, they find all these gold bars, they find couches stuffed with $100 bills. I mean, uh, anyway, um, most of the NATO countries and the countries that are friendly to uh, the United States in the Pacific, the Indo-Pacific region, don't have corruption problems. Um, basically, Italy's the worst at 56, when they really don't do much in the Indo-Pacific. Most of their interests are in the uh, Mediterranean and the uh, Red Sea area. Um, South Korea is next at 63. I mean, basically, you're talking countries where most of the money is actually getting to where it's supposed to go. Soldiers are actually getting trained. Equipment's actually being bought. And there is just no damn way on this planet that you can take $291 billion in military spending and say that with the corruption level that they've got in China, that it's going to equal to the, how should I put it, uh, billion 
plus since I didn't add up the East Asian one, the um, Indo-Pacific area ones that the Indo-Pacific nations are spending? I don't think so. I really don't. And, you know, we're talking about corruption or arrests. Did you know that the uh, Russian Federation arrested the scientists who designed the Kinzhal hypersonic missile? Yeah, they did. For espionage. Supposedly they leaked the information to the West because we knew about a fair bit about the missile. Never mind the fact that with the number of satellite assets that various countries have up and independents like uh, Maxar, that you can see a lot of this stuff if you are willing to spend the money to buy the pictures. And countries that don't have the number of surveillance assets like the United States or the UK or China can buy that access on a variety of places, never mind the fact that in some cases it's directly shared. There are a number of people who have direct access to the United States um, reconnaissance information. Think about that. It isn't just the United States knowing what's going on in Russia and China. It's a whole bunch of other people too. And all those people are looking at it and they're making their plans. Because while they weren't expecting Russia to kick off, probably for the same reasons I wasn't expecting them to kick off. Nobody could believe that Putin would be that bloody stupid. There's actually far greater reason to be concerned about uh, the People's Republic of China and Chairman Z. That was where I was really worried about things starting up, and I still am. I don't think Z is getting the information he needs. I don't think he realizes how bad the corruption is in his system. I don't think he realizes what a hollow shell his military is. And you think I'm joking? Look up the war against uh, the People's Republic of China against Vietnam. Look up the People's Republic of China peacekeeping operations in East Africa, where Chinese peacekeepers took one look at uh, the uh, oncoming uh, militants and decided rather than protecting the people they're supposed to protect, they'd rather run. Think about that. And again, don't forget, Russia and China are conscript heavy militaries. Yes, I know Russia doesn't use conscripts outside of Russia. It doesn't matter. Those conscripts who are inside of Russia free up the contract soldiers to go outside. China also is very heavy with conscripts. And in both countries, you can pay your way out of being conscripted. Of course, having somebody who has high connections really helps. So, yeah, that's basically what the military situation is. So the people giving you the garbage take that Russia is going to conquer Ukraine easily, they're either lying, they misunderstand the situation, they haven't actually looked at the data, or their assets, whether they're paid or not, I don't know and I don't care. The point is that they're doing a lot of damage because it's scaring people in ways that they shouldn't be scared. You know, yes, Russia or China could decide to launch nukes. Sure they could, if they want to commit suicide. Using nuclear weapons would draw an instant response and they don't want to die. They don't. They want to maintain their power. And Putin and Z will do anything to do, maintain their power, just like Kim in uh, Korea, or, um, oh, rats, I should remember that aim of that Sephorki in 
Eritrea. I mean, you're talking some really unsavory characters. And they're going to hang on to power as long as they can because that's the only thing they have. If they fall from power, there's all too good of a chance they could end up falling out of a window or drinking polonium tea. So, anyway, that's it for this episode of Wayne's World of Science and Technology. I hope this made sense. Um, if it didn't, let me know why. If you have data that disagrees with what I've got, provide me the information. I'm always looking for more data. But don't tell me that Russia's going to win because that's what you heard. and Everybody knows Russia's the second strongest military in the world. Look at the military spending. How could they be? So stay safe, folks, and I'll talk to you later.